Hey guys, this is Legit from Advantage Coaching, and today I'm going to be going over ideas and showing you how to play in the Sicilian Veshnikov. After e4, c5, we enter the Sicilian, and the most popular continuation following is knight f3, where we will play, play knight f6, d4, is the open Sicilian where we trade off a win pawn for a center pawn, gaining a pawn majority in the center and a semi-open file. In return, white gets free piece development and will usually have the initiative in an attack. Next, we play knight f6, attacking this weak e pawn, where the only good continuation for white is knight c3. This is where we enter the Veshnikov Sicilian. We will play e5, putting the question to this knight on where it wants to go. Moves such as knight f3 or similarly knight b3, we will answer with bishop b4 where white will only have two options. Bishop d2 runs into bishop takes, bishop takes, and then knight takes. We're just winning a pawn, so it'll be a bad move. So bishop d3, we can easily answer with the quick d5 break. And this is something that all Sicilians have in common that you want to try and get in. So, and we punish white's passive play by immediately breaking and this will give us the initiative as you see now we have two attackers on the c3 knight and white has to find a way of defending this the only sensible way is to play d2 something you will notice is that in many Veshnikov lines white only has one sensible move to make other moves will just give black a good game as you already see we have the initiative so we'll play bishop takes not wanting to trade off our nicely centralized knight more commonly than not, you'll see bishop takes here rather than voluntarily doubling their pawns. From here, there's a number of ways, but if you're just starting out in the Veshnikov and want to get into it easily without remembering stuff, you can just double their pawns here. And then follow through with a plan of castles. Bishop out here, following with rook here, threatening this fork. Rook here to the semi-open file we talked about game play against these weak pawns. So from this we can decide that bishop d3 here is a bad move. So let's go back to bishop b4. After this the other option white has is bishop g5. And this is creating a counter pin so that our knight can no longer come in and take this pawn. You may have heard of the infamous bishop pair in chess, where one side has two bishops in an open position, which is worth half a pawn in theory, in most positions. In this case, we can play h6. If the bishop were to retreat, we would come in with g5, following by bishop to g3, and we'd take the pawn on e4. So they are effectively forced to take our f6 knight. And we now have two bishops, and we can open up the position and have a great advantage. We also have free reign to really play how we want. We can follow in castling. You can either, if you can play it really how you want, you can play very safely with d3 bishop there. You can think out of your bishop, get play against this pawn. Or you can just play for this d5 break straight up. You really have a lot of options, and you're the one controlling how the game is played really. White doesn't have a lot of say. So we can decide that knight f3 isn't a good move. As you'll notice, I'll just quickly show you here, knight b3 runs into the same problem. Bishop d3, bishop g5, where we'll play the same moves. The One of the other two options they have is knight f5. And as you'll notice, we can no longer bring our bishop out to b4 like we'd want to. And this is because following bishop b4, they can now come into d6 with check. And we don't want to misplace our king at the moment. So, because following bishop here, pinning the knight to the king and check, we'll be in a very bad position. So we're forced to take. And now the queen is interfering with our castle square. This bishop really has no future. And white really has all the play in this position which isn't what we want. So we're not going to make that mistake. So 
here's a nice segue into the main line where this square becomes our main problem. So the bishop, they rule off with this move one of our options, bishop b4. So we're going to play d5 instantly, once again punishing the fairly slow play by white. And we can, we're adding an extra attacker to this pawn, we can advance, and we're allowed to bring our bishop to b4 now because the queen is now defending the square as well. So more often than not, you'll just see them take here, and this allows us the tactical trick from d5 to just take the knight, which is now hanging since the pawn left on f5. And they're forced to take our knight, otherwise they'll be down in material. We'll trade queens. King takes to guard this square. We take, and then we have very simple plans of knight here, thrown in to take there and fork. This square is weak. This across here to check. This here maybe threaten to double pawns or something, then it will become a static weakness when both of these pawns are here, since this pawn, which is pressured at the moment, won't be able to move forward because its counterpart will be blocking it. So that that's all very easy for us as well. We just look over that quickly. D5, E takes, Bishop takes, D takes, Queen takes, King takes, and we're in a good position. So now the we can see that the only real option white has for a good game is to come to b5. And this rules out two things. Now, because as we saw before, this square's being attacked, the bishop can't come to b4, but we also can't push d5 because there's no longer after they take the pawn here, there's no longer a knight hanging on the f5 square right here in the blue. So we're forced to play d6, and this is why it's mainline from white, because they can take away both of your main options. So from here, one move you'll see quite rarely is knight d5, attacking this square, trying to fork your king and your rook. This can be easily answered with knight takes, pawn takes, queen doesn't usually take because knight back to here attacking the queen. And in this position you can choose between Knight e7, putting pressure on the center, supporting that push, does a couple of things, or I prefer knight b8. And what you're doing is you're rerouting the knight to here eventually, after some standard moves, and you get a very nice position out of it. So I also think it's a very unexpected move if people do play this, so I usually expect you to play knight e7, so has that back factor. And you're mostly fine in these positions. You won't usually play it though. The move you'll usually see is bishop g5. And something I'd like you to note, in the first six moves, white has moved this one knight three times. He has lost a lot of time just running his pieces around the board, not doing a lot. Well, we have just moved our pawns up, developed quite nicely. We're about equal in development now. White doesn't have much of an advantage. In fact, it's our move here. So, we're actually doing quite well, and we're just going to hit this knight again with a6. And now notice how all of these squares are blocked off, either by, mostly by our guarded pieces, or in this case over here, by their own knight. So it's forced, once again, very forcing continuations, forced to move their knight back. And we're just going to follow with b5. This does a couple of things. First of all, it threatens to play b4, hitting both knights and winning us material, but it also takes away this flight square for the knight. And um, because of this, they're uh, pretty much always going to follow up with knight here. And um, well, there's two options, knight, sorry, knight here or bishop takes here. I'm going to look at knight takes here quickly. Now, here, bishop e7 is the only move you should really look at if in your own time you want to look at this, queen a5, which is dubbed the silent draw offer, is um, another option, but I think it's good. This bishop e7 move sets up the um, threat of taking on d5, and then this piece is being hit, obviously, if they take here, knight's going to come back down, and take it again and we're just going to be up a piece. So they're forced to do something. In the event of, I'll show you this quickly, knight takes here, 
Then you have the option of pushing d5 or bringing the knight back and pushing f5. f5 and d5 are the two main pushes you want to look out for in the Veshnikov. They're really your winning chances come from that. So after this is the main move, the one you'll see most of the time. We're just going to take on f6. And usually, in some order, they might play bishop d3 and castle first, but they're going to play c3 or c4, in which case you'll just push these pawns up. Um, so we're just going to castle here, and c3 is used to get this knight back into the game. So here, an important move to remember is rook b8, because they can no longer push this pawn forward, since after we take, this pawn here will be hanging. So a continuation might be something like this. Once again, the move orders vary, but it's usually the same. We're just going to play bishop g5. Shouldn't be afraid to take off this knight controlling powerful squares for a bishop, which is theoretically our bad bishop. Um, something like this. And then we can really choose how to play here, like bring the knight back, and then either bishop here going for this push if you want, or the more common f5 push. So um, that's really all you need to know to play the bishop e7 variation, it's not very forcing. The other one is this, bishop takes f6, followed by g takes f6, and most of the time, almost always, you're going to see the knight coming here, removing the threat of the pawn. And no, we don't want to push this up, because it will let the knight get back into the game. We're just going to immediately play this pawn up. And what this does is it pressures the center, and not only can we take the pawn in the center, but after we take it, we can also also push out our doubled pawn and still have these three strong central pawns that we can just push up the board and it really it really becomes a weapon if you get them rolling. So what you'll usually see is bishop here threatening to take this pawn, also guarding it. We're going to respond with bishop e6 because it's no longer possible for white to take since the communication line to white's Knight has been interrupted. They will castle or play c3. Once again, move orders don't matter too much. We're just going to respond with rook b8 like we did in the other one, removing the option of this a4 push. And um, now there's plenty of things they can really try. So... Here there's lots and lots of ways to play, many people just like to bring their knight back and remove the knight here, that's really the Veshnikov is about the fight for d5. There's lots of lines where you can just take here, then after bishop takes you can just bring this pawn up and, you know, use these two central pawns here just to push up the board and just really create some initiative on the king side with all this open space over here. Queen will come out, possibly some tactics there. So, um, hopefully you kind of get a feel for the ideas. Something like this, you know, bring it across, just trying to go for these pushes. Hopefully I've got that across. Um. This is a finishing thought. Hopefully you can put some, you know, of your own work into it. Really enjoy it. I really enjoyed playing the system. And um, I did have a longer video organized, 40 minutes actually, very in-depth. But YouTube doesn't allow that. And um, visit, you should visit our page at facebook.com, Advantage Coaching. No spaces there because there's lots of blogs, videos... Um, you can get free lessons from some very strong players there. And um, hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully it helped in some way. Leave any comments, any feedback. I haven't done much of this, so any suggestions would, of course, be a help. Thanks for watching.